everyone, this year has gone super fast, right? It's already that time of the year again, and today we have the last episode for 2020 of the podcast series When Machine Learning Meets Data Privacy. And no, it's not yet the last episode, but you have to wait for 2021 for the episodes on federated learning and synthetic data. I'm your host, Fabiana. And for those of you that are listening and are not yet members of our community, don't be shy. Just join us on Hamelop Slack to learn more about with the best in the industry. This podcast series is sponsored by YData, a startup that delivers the first dataset experimentation platform for data scientists to build datasets in a fraction of the time and cost they used to, while keeping an eye on data quality and leveraging tools such as data labeling and synthetic data generation. Let's just jump into the topics of today. And I know that many of you are super into it. Differential privacy. To tell us a bit more about this privacy-enhancing technology that can be applied whenever developing machine learning solutions, I have invited Christos Dimitratakis, professor in the University of Oslo, Christus comes already with multiple publications in the area of machine learning and differential privacy. Hi, Christus. Glad to have you here with us in the podcast. I would love to hear more about you and your experience and what took you to start specializing in these areas. My background was actually engineering, uh, but then I did a thesis topic on uh, what was called at the time genetic programming or genetic algorithms and from there on I got an interest in artificial intelligence and this is what drew me to reinforcement learning and I got a book about it at some point uh, during my master's degree and well privacy it's something that I saw I saw the definition of differential privacy actually and I was thinking wow this is a strange definition and then we look at the definition and then we some mathematical investigations around this definition specifically how to relate to Bayesian inference and basically, this was my first paper about the topic, essentially. So it was more like a mathematical curiosity initially, but right now, I, for me, differential privacy is like a, privacy in general. It's, it's an interesting topic. Uh, it's quite distinct from the cryptographic uh, privacy topic in some sense, which I'm not really interested in. It's not, it's not really my field. Uh, they're looking at very different questions. Can you please walk us through what is, in the end, um, this field? or specific of privacy, well, how can we know when to benefit of such a solution when, or when to use others such as cryptography, for example? Let me start with cryptography because everybody is somehow uh, at least familiar with the basic primitives of cryptography. So you know that if you have a file and you want to keep it secret from everybody, then you can encrypt it. And then if you only have access to the key, then more or less only you will be able to uh, decrypt your file unless somebody has access to a very, very powerful computer and then they can spend lots of computation time to uh, discover your secret. Or if they have some other access to your uh, to your system, so if there's some kind of uh, bug in the algorithm or some other such an attack you can do, typically there's no way you can recover it. Okay, so this, so cryptography is usually a method for keeping secrets. So simplest case is you keep a secret for yourself, it's a bit more difficult if you need to exchange a message with somebody else in secret. Then you have to agree on a key, essentially, that you share. And that was the initial way of, of, of doing things. So you both know the key and you can share something. But now there is this a new idea of public key cryptography, where you can actually have a key that is split in two parts, a public and a private one. And then, essentially, uh, you can use this idea to share things with other people without sharing a key. That's also basically is relying this one is actually relying mostly on, let's say, computational uh, capabilities of the adversary that they are not able to crack, let's say, uh, the secret key from your public key. While the secret sharing scheme, where you can have a secret you and your uh, friend to communicate a secret key, that is more an information theory concept in the sense that there might not be a computational challenge for the adversary. It's just that they don't have the information necessary to decode, and without the information, it's impossible to decode. And this is actually a bit, a bit closer to the, what is differential privacy. So differential privacy is a bit different, and privacy in general is a bit different because we care about privacy of individual data, but we still want 
to learn something from individual data. So we want to take some look into the individual's data, right? But we don't really care about you or me or somebody else specifically. We only care about the aggregate in some sense. So I'll take a very simple example. Uh, let's say you want to ask people in sports if they are doping, if they're taking drugs for performance enhancement. Of course, nobody would admit to actually taking drugs for performance enhancement, right? Even if you tell them that everything is anonymous, etc., well, they still say, well, I mean, if you, let's say you write your answers on a, on a piece of paper, yeah? So everybody says yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Then if you do that, then if somebody knows the order with which you ask people whether or not they take drugs, then you would know who has taken drugs and who not, right? So it's not enough to say that nobody will see your name. So if somebody has the information somewhere, maybe because they, that's how they contacted you in the first place, so possible to reconstruct who had drugs, who has taken drugs. So one idea is to say, well, let's say that I give you a coin or I give you a mechanism. A coin is a simple enough mechanism. So you throw the coin in and you don't show it to me. And then if the coin comes up heads, then you say the opposite of what is true. Uh, sorry, then you say you take drugs. Okay, that works better. Then you say drugs. And then if it comes up heads, uh, tails, then you, you say the truth. There will be 50, at least 50% of the people will say yes that I'm taking drugs because of these coin tosses, right? So when you say yes, then the person that interviews you will not say, will not know whether you're saying yes because you are actually taking drugs or because the coin came up heads. From this one answer, they're not able to tell whether you have been taking drugs. I mean, they will say, okay, if you say yes, it's slightly more likely that you are taking drugs than, than you're not. Now, of course, if everybody says yes, then Again, you say you can say basically that half of the people must be taking drugs, uh, but you don't know who. Half of them will have just have a head, and half of them will just uh, have have tails and said yes anyway. Uh, so yeah, you cannot say who has taken drugs or who has not taken drugs. So that was one of the first, maybe the first mechanism that was uh, developed that actually guarantees what we call now differential privacy. And you can think about it this way: you want to publish not actually the individual results of drug tests or, or, or drug answers you want just to publish the aggregate how many people are taking drugs and in this particular case you can basically subtract the effect of the uh, of the coin tosses so you can have a more accurate estimate of how many people are actually taking drugs so you remove the 60 percent that you know is going to be true anyway and what you left is is a good estimate of whom, how many are actually taking drugs so this is a basic example of what you want to do so when you say that i can more or less define the, the the probability of the coin flipping for one side or the other uh, what do you mean by that specifically in, in this particular example we have an actual coin or another device that you you know is fair and, and can half of the time say heads and the other half say say tails and then if i tell the person when it comes to say yes i'm taking drugs and when it's when it's tails then say the truth then that's the mechanism and that's all. I mean, the randomness, you, as a statistician, you have to know how often the coin will come heads or tails in order for you to be able to compute exactly how many people or approximately how many people are actually taking drugs. But you have to know this, yeah. So if it's 50-50, you can say it's 50-50, for example. This might, might be a funny question, but okay, let's assume in this example that, or at least let's think broadly about this example. So would you say that, for example, is it feasible to apply differential privacy for very small data sets? Let's say, uh, if I understood right, we are kind of introducing some wrong answers, let's say, into the matrix or the questionnaire. How would those answers or that information impact the results in the end? If okay. we are doing, for example, with the small data set or... Typically, the larger your data set, the better results you can get with some privacy. And, and the fewer features you have, generally, the better. In this particular case, especially because, you, let's say, if you're asking many things about the, about, the, about the drug use and about the sport, and etc., then you have more information you want to hide apart from the fact that they're actually uh, taking drugs, or not, typically. So the scaling issue, basically, I cannot give you a precise answer, but essentially, there is one parameter in differential privacy, which we call the privacy loss, it's called epsilon. And typically, the amount of data, you, it's like 
when you increase epsilon, then you lose a, a proportion of your data by a factor that is more or less one minus epsilon, you could say. Let's put it this way. If epsilon is the amount of information you lose, in the sense that the information you leak about individuals, you can think about it this way. When you, when you set epsilon to zero, then you leak all information about individuals. This means that nobody can learn anything about any individual from the release of the data or from the release of your statistics. But also it means that you cannot learn anything from the statistics anyway, it's like useless. Now, when this epsilon goes to zero, it's useless, but for any higher value, it's more or less as though if you had k pieces of data, then if you set privacy to epsilon, then you, it's like you have epsilon k pieces of data. So it kind of depends on your problem. It's more or less as, as though you have epsilon k pieces of data. So if you have epsilon to half, to 0 0.5, it's more or less like you have half the amount of data you would have normally. So it's not really a terrible, terrible thing, but it's, yeah, if you want a meaningful privacy protection, sometimes you need to say it's very, very low. Uh, it depends on the application. Now, having said that, setting this epsilon is not very, very, intuitive and there is no clear way of doing it, setting exactly what kind of mechanism you want to use. So if you think about practical things, I would say, well, you have data, you have the inference you want to solve, the inference you want to solve. So you can just apply a, a differential private mechanism and tune the parameters of the mechanism, how much privacy you want, especially, essentially, up to the point where you see a, a, a significant degradation in your results. So you have to go up to the level where you, you have degradation that's just about detectable compared to not, no privacy at all. And at that point, you basically you have to stop because it's not going to be useful anymore. So the main criterion would be as high privacy as possible so that you can get the results that are good enough. So if I understood right, it's all about a trade-off between the utility that you get and the privacy level that you are setting. Uh, is that correct? That is more or less correct. However, there is, there is a bit of a, a kink here. There have been some results that say that, well, if you're actually using differential privacy in an algorithm, let's say in a learning algorithm, this additional randomness more or less helps your algorithm generalize in some sense. So if you're, if you're in particular, if you're, if you're trying to tune hyperparameters for your algorithm, like a lot of people are doing that, let's say during the number of layers or whatever, uh, the dropout rate or I don't know what, uh, in your neural networks. Well, this is quite a high dimensional uh, optimization problem, right? And they typically what they do is uh, they have this training and validation set and, and they or do cross-validation or something like that. There's one interesting thing that is a bit weird. So let's say I had a validation set, right? And I never actually see the validation set. Right? Let's say it's a classification problem, very simple. Let's say now that what I do is I... I get a classifier, an arbitrary classifier, let's say a linear classifier, very simple one, and I see how much I write, how many examples I have wrong and how many examples I have correct. Let's say now that I change the classifier slightly, so I shift the hyperplane slightly, let's say to the left or whatever. Then I say now I have one more example that is wrong than before. Okay, since I know what my classifier was before and I know what it is now and I know I have just one error somewhere, that means that there was one example in between my previous hyperplane and the current one, right? which now I classify incorrectly and before I was classifying correctly. So now I can guess where there was one specific example in my validation set. So you can, ex you can imagine a case where you have a bunch of, like you test a million or a billion different classifiers on this validation set and you see what their performance is. And just from this one number, you can basically guess exactly what the structure of this validation set is. Essentially you are testing with hyperplanes where there are different classes of points. So you can do that kind of binary search in some way and find out what is there. Now, so essentially when you're doing hyperparameter tuning, if you're doing it a lot, then essentially you, you are kind of learning about the validation set a little bit. Um, so we have observed this, uh, I think the community observed this in the past in these Kaggle competitions where a lot of people, they do very well in, in this uh, competition phase in the beginning and then when it's the final result, the, the ordering of the method is very different. Some validators at the top in, in the first phase, they are, they are worse in the second phase because in the first phase, they use a common validation set and then at the end, they have a, a new previously unseen test set and their, their performance uh, ordering is very different. And this is partly the reason. And one thing you can do is if you are using, you can use differential privacy as a way to get information about how well you're doing in your validation set, but without actually getting the perfect performance. So uh, measure. So essentially you're saying, the question you would ask is something like this. 
in my training set, my performance is, is this much. How much, and the question you're asking is, is my performance in the validation set more than epsilon worse than my training set? And then you get a yes, no answer. And if you gotta do this kind of tuning, so basically you throw out all the parameters where you have more than epsilon, uh, if you do this kind of tuning, then you, you cannot learn a lot about uh, the validation set. And you can do a lot of tuning as well. And in the results I have seen, they were quite simple, but still uh, they are very suggestive. You see that it's not possible really to, uh, let's say, to overfit uh, your data. So you, you can actually gain something from differential privacy. And there have been some theoretical results that in another context as well. So it's not like differential privacy is negative always in the sense of, in the sense of, uh, of uh, utility. If you're talking about small data sets, of course, you say I have a small data set and I need to learn something about this data set, then pretty much you're stuck. There's not much you can do, right? But that's the game. If, if you want really to publish a, some statistics about the small data set, let's say of about 20 people, then essentially you're saying, well, it's a very small group, and if I publish something about this, anything, then of course, private information will be leaked. If I want to hide the private information, then that means I have to change, add a lot of noise to the data, or I have to. There's no other way to hide individual data. It's natural that this happens. Yeah, correct. correct. So it's not like it's an easy problem to solve and there is a clear way to do it. So yeah, I get it. And that perspective that differential privacy can be useful to for us to, to discover new things about, for example, the validation stats, that, that is quite interesting. And to be honest, I, I think it's not a perspective that we get that often from differential privacy, at least in the more common posts or information about the, this area, to be honest. In that sense, if I understood correct, we can apply differential privacy directly to, to the model weights, correct? Yeah, yeah, it is possible. What is the difference in terms of benefits for privacy of having the differential privacy applied to the model weights versus when it is applied, for example, when we want to do a query to a data set? I would say that there are three ways you could do it. The first is take the data, and then when you do want to do something with the data, then you use what is called the local privacy model, which is what I explained in the first example, where you manipulate the data, you adjust the data in some way. Okay, so then you can do whatever you want. There's this this theorem called the post-processing theorem, which says that after you have privatized your data, some variable that depends on the data, then if you do it, whatever you do with this variable, you cannot regain any information. It's standard information theoretic stuff. Now you can go any, anywhere, let's say that my data is used to create the weights. But if I throw away the data and then I do something with the weights in a differential private manner, so then that should also guarantee privacy. But you have to be very careful to do it correctly, of course. So typically what you have is the optimization algorithm that generates the weights from the data is essentially a function, right? Maybe very, very complicated function, you cannot do it analytically. That's the problem here, actually. Uh, so it's a function. And this function, if you just use a complicated function, it, it basically tells you there is this thing called sensitivity of a function. So essentially how much the output of the function changes when you change the input slightly. And this is a crucial concept in, in getting a differentially private algorithms that are not just manipulating the data, but manipulating some function, uh, like in this case. So if you want to have private weights, then you have to analyze the sensitivity of this function, and then you have to add nodes to the weights proportional to the sensitivity of the function uh, in general. Now, specifically for stochastic gradient descent, you basically optimize uh, in steps. So in every step, you move in a different direction. And the idea is that whenever you randomly set, select a batch of data, then what you do is you add a little bit of noise to the gradient calculation. It's already a bit noisy because you have already subsampled the data a little bit. And for this, you can actually calculate a uh, privacy loss. And what you do is essentially, you do stochastic gradient descent for a number of steps. And so that the total privacy loss after you have finished the computation is bounded by some number, epsilon, let's say. And this is your total privacy loss. And this is easier than just doing it for an arbitrary validation algorithm. Okay, because here you know every step uh, how it's done. It's, it's relatively simple. And this subsampling also helps with privacy. I haven't mentioned this before, but if there are 10 people that you're looking at and you know which 10 people there are, then of course the privacy uh, problem is much harder. 
if you know that there are 10 people out of a 10 million and you don't know who they are, you just know they were randomly selected, then you are some gaining a little bit with privacy because the adversary or whoever it is that wants to learn something, they would not know who these 10 people were. They just know that they had an equal chance of being any 10 people uh, out of the 10 million. Uh, and this makes the privacy uh, a little bit easier. And this is one of the things that helps I think a little bit uh, with batch stochastic uh, grain descent uh, being a useful algorithm uh, for uh, for privacy, let's say neural networks or something like that. So I have to say that that I did see some results which suggest that if you want to have a meaningful privacy protection, then it's not really the results you get using that kind of stuff are not very good sometimes. Uh, so in practice, you have you lose a lot of utility. So I'm not sure how practical it actually is. Uh, the results I've seen are a bit contradictory. That is a, a very interesting perspective on how well how well we can apply this, especially when talking about applying differential privacy to, to the models. But that also brings me another question regarding differential privacy. And this this one, I, I think it's the most common when it comes to the, um, the application of differential privacy in, for example, the context of organizations. In your perspective, do you feel that differential privacy and even other privacy enhancing technologies have already achieved the maturity to be used, for example, in production systems. For example, I, I, I think you, you probably ha- are aware of the Facebook's project and the use of differential privacy to publish a data set for research because they, they are bounded to all these questions about privacy and all the concern, mainly because they were uh, deeply related with uh, some problems on a few years ago with the Cambridge Analytics, they have decided to release public data sets with some information from the users, and they would release those data sets to researchers. So the idea was, would be to, to foster innovation, spe- specifically to foster some studies on the side of the more political side by research teams. And these da- data sets that were released have applied differential privacy in order to reduce the privacy leakage from the data. In the first instance, I think they did it, but the utility of the data was not at least the ideal. But from the latest information, I think they have released another data set more recently. The utility was uh, totally different from the first one that was released. Okay, I'm just checking, checking it out right now. And I see that they have actually uh, hired a, a group of very good people for doing, for helping with the studies. So I, I, I'm just because of who they hired and what I read, they have written up a paper calling, called Guidelines for Implementing and Auditing Differential Private Systems. This is kind of a new paper, it's this year. So from what I see, it's a pretty good introduction for anybody that is essentially an outsider in the area. It has some graphical intuition, talks about sensitivity at some point, post-processing, code review, randomness. So it's, it's, I think it's a pretty good overview uh, if your folks want to look at it at some point. If they use these people, then I'm guessing that they have done a good job when they release the data to the, to the researchers. So it's, it's a nice effort, I would say. I think so, especially because what I feel like in terms of the industry is that this kind of solutions for privacy can be highly useful, of course, at different levels and at different stages of the the machine learning process. But there is a lack of guidelines of how to apply them or how and when they, they, they should be applied to the data and what concerns should exist in production systems when applying them. And I think that that article is a nice example of a good effort. And in this case, it's a great thing to have from research community for the ones that want to start applying differential privacy in, in production systems. Yeah, I mean, one problem with production systems is that, first of all, there are not a lot of off-the-shelf solutions already. So if you want to do it your, by yourself, then there is always a possibility of an error. And then if you do it by yourself, you also have to do the privacy analysis yourself, more or less. 
uh, and that's annoying. The only real solution right now is uh, these languages that already implement differential privacy within them. That's fine. However, I think that those languages are only very limited and you can only use them for some uh, specific things. So I think something like making very simple database queries in database. I don't know if, if there is a general programming language. I don't think there's a general programming language that you could use with differential privacy. And even if, if you could, I don't know if you could actually use it in production system. I don't know if it would scale actually. So these are kind of different things that are uh, problematic. I know that, for example, for the census, for the US 2020 census, they had to do a customized solution for what they wanted to do because they had a very specific problem because they get all the data from people. The census basically asked people uh, where they live, how many people they are in the household, how much money they're making, and lots of stuff. And then they want to use the data in a quite detailed way in order to make various uh, histograms uh, to see what correlates with what. So essentially what they wanted to do is to publish they didn't want to have to give good direct access to the data, but what they decided to do was to basically create, a, let's say, thousands or millions of different histograms that are slightly noisy, where they could ask all the, where they would, that would contain all the information that people might want to ask about the data, if I understand correctly. So that's that's already quite complicated, and I think that essentially the amount of data they need to store afterwards, let's say the differential private data, something like a, one thousand times as much as the original data. Because this is what they wanted to do, uh, they had a specific thing that they wanted to do, they had a specific solution for, for their own problem, and I wouldn't say that, let's say, the same thing would be useful for some other, uh, in some other context. They wanted to find the best solution that would give you the most utility for the, as, as little of, of privacy as possible, uh, and in a sense, this is what they did. But now if you're saying, well, I want to keep data for my employees, let's say, because I want to track various things, I don't know what I want to do with it, then it becomes a tricky. If you don't know what you, you're going to use the data for, then it's much more tricky because uh, essentially you need to, let's say, guard the access to the data in the first place from any yeah. analyst yeah. and how they're going to use it. If we don't know what to do with the data specifically or what we want to do with the data, it's far more hard to decide from the beginning, what kind of privacy technology that we want to apply? And in the case of differential privacy, it makes even just harder. Did I understood correct? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, if you, let's say you want to use this randomized response mechanism that I mentioned in the beginning. Okay, you can use that if you want. But then for your application, it, it might not make a lot of sense to do that. You would not know what happens. So you throw away the data, you keep this thing. Uh, you pass this around to everybody, that means that you have already lost some privacy by doing that in the first place. Now, if you say that this is not actually what I, I needed because it doesn't work for my application, then you have to go back to the original data and, and do something else with it, and then it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, let's say you use a differential private uh, gradient descent, fine, and if there's a neural network with organized spaces, fine, uh, that's not a problem. But now you have already lost some privacy from the first release, now you're losing some additional privacy from the second release. And every time you do something else with the data, it accumulates. So if you have a use case for the data from the beginning, then you can essentially minimize your privacy loss by knowing what you want to do with the data. And then you can just develop your private algorithm for a specific application. And then you, you, you have, you will be, you'll be much better. So, but this is a general thing I think about privacy. Whenever you think about, you, you need some data. You have to decide what you want to do the data. What are you going to do to the data? Are you going to analyze it in this way or that way? Are you just going to store it? Why do you need to store it? So that's a general thing about the GDPR also, I think. Uh, you have to have a specific use case for the data. That's very much related with data management rather than at least the traditional thought uh, of data privacy because what we get in terms of, uh, at least uh, of understanding is that everyone nowadays is just collecting data for the sake of collecting it but they are forgetting that data will only have value if we we know what to do with it or we have an answer that we want answered, let's say. So, and in that sense, it's, it's very interesting and quite interesting to see that the fact that we don't have a specific strategy that might, from the beginning, be a privacy issue already. Christos, this has been a, a very interesting overview on what is differential privacy and how we can benefit from it. I do have a last ask for you. 
So usually in this podcast, we have this section that is very close to my heart, the open mic, where we ask for the guests to share with us something that you have find amazing during your path in through machine learning and special privacy. Would you have something that you would like to share with us from your experience? One thing about differential privacy is that it's a very strict definition of privacy. So it basically protects even the fact that somebody might be part of the data set or not. So you don't even get this information out of it if your algorithm is differentially private. So a lot of people have actually worked recently on generalizations of differential privacy. And those are, are much nicer in some sense because they give very similar guarantees, very rigorous guarantees, but the amount the utility you get out of them is, is much higher. So there's a lot of interesting research in that area. Uh, but then again, I believe that the off-the-shelf solutions for those definitions are even fewer and further between. And there is finally there is one other thing that I want to mention, but maybe a bit interesting. Sometimes you don't really care about protecting whether or not somebody is in the database or the data of an individual in the database, but you care for, of protecting some other secret that is related to this. Let's take an example. We worked on an application actually about on smart grids. So smart grids basically measure the, the, cons the consumption of the household, uh, sometimes at the second level, and they use this uh, for electricity markets uh, to get a better price for electricity, essentially. Now, what you would like to hide sometimes is whether or not somebody is in the house or what is the uh, typical movement pattern of somebody in the house. Now, this is not exactly the same thing as hiding the data of electricity, right? But it's related, of course. Yeah. So the thing is that because the electricity data depends, let's say, in a very correlated way with, with your actual movement partners patterns, it is not actually possible to fully guarantee privacy of your movement partners, even if you say that the individual records that you submit to the electricity company every day are differentially private. So every time you release, so the records are individually private, so you cannot really infer exactly how much consumption you had at any point in time, but you could always average those results and see how often you are in the house in the morning, right? So it's very simple. So this is something that a lot of people sometimes misunderstand about differential privacy and say, ah, differential privacy doesn't take into account correlation or it makes assumptions about IID data or something like that. It's something I would say emphatically, no, this is not true. It's like, but you should be careful because the secret you want to hide, yeah, is in this case is the, the occupancy of the house but the actual thing in the data is not the occupancy, is the, the electricity consumption. So there are different things. So you should be very careful when you're thinking about differential privacy. It's not like a full privacy protection of everything. Uh, it's essentially only privacy of the data records that you put in there. So you're only protecting the data records. And then depending on how you actually put the data inside, if you say it's lines one day, for example, for your uh, electricity consumption, then you essentially only the adversary will not be able to differentiate between your data in one day and another day. But that's all, the only thing they will not be able to differentiate. If you have data for five years, then we will take quite a lot about you, essentially. Right? True, true, totally true. Although many of us, sometimes we do forgot that things like energy consumption or even things like just an app to measure our exercise yeah, yeah. It can tell a lot about our habits and more than just uh, how many energy are we consuming or how fast we are. So yeah. that's a very interesting perspective on, on, on this, especially that we always have to take into consideration there are many sides from the same data and we have to take those in, into consideration. I, I would just like to close with one thing. So in the end, it's about who you trust. So let's say that the, the athlete that uses the differential private response mechanism doesn't trust the person that is taking the survey, right? If you're using a watch or something, then you're trusting the person that made the watch, you're trusting the company that keeps your data, you're trusting everybody, right? Essentially, when you decide how you, your data is going to be used, then you have to decide what is that trust level you're going to, you're going to take it up to. As a company, you also have to do it that, that way around. You have all this all these people that you want to serve, how are you going to make them trust you, right? What guarantees can you give them for them to be able to give you their data? And what can you promise them and what can you not promise them, right? As far as I can tell, there is not a lot of promises that are actually being made from the company side. 
uh, they're more like saying, ah, oh, we can just give you data to third parties. Please say yes. That's totally true. <laughs> but in the end, it's up to the consumers to decide whether they are up to give their data or not. In, and yeah, I have to agree. And I think that was an excellent way to, to close this conversation. Christos, once again, thanks a lot for your time. It was a very interesting talk. And uh, above all, it's, it was a, a, a different perspective from we have seen so far about differential privacy that I have to say many of us doesn't have. So thank you for this. Thank you, Fabiana. It was a pleasure and a big thanks from the MLOs community as well.